George Washington is known for his service to the military, his honesty, and his success as the first president of the United States. But most people do not realize he was also a spectacular businessman. After retiring from political life, he soon found great success as a whiskey maker in America. And for that, we are preparing dishes that would have been sourced right from his backyard at Mount Vernon. Today's menu includes pecan stuffed suckling pig, poi kidney, and ragu of salsifis and cordon. And for dessert, we make in plum pudding drenched in George Washington's rye whiskey. All for a neat taste of history. So this episode is about George Washington's rye, but you know, he couldn't live of rye alone, so there got to be some food. I found out that he had up to 150 pigs roaming right behind the distillery. Since the suckling pig takes about an hour and a half to cook, I'm concentrating first on getting the pig in the oven, so I'm making the stuffing, which is a pecan, salilan, sage, sausage stuffing. I'm starting with the pecans, which by the way was George Washington's favorite nut, actually. He planted a huge pecan tree right next to Mount Vernon. The pecans, when I use them, I like to always put a little heat on them. Just warm them up a little bit. It releases the oils again when it gets warm and it's much more flavor. I'm using salilan bread, but for those kind of recipes, we make a Pullman loaf. So the reason that people go crazy over my stuffing anytime, not just on Thanksgiving, is that I toast the croutons. Most people don't do that. So toasting it, gets additional flavor into it. And the bread itself is a brioche, so it has a lot of flavor on its own already. I have the croutons already pre-toasted. I got some onions that I already sweat. Again, you want to sweat the onions for the only reason that if you don't cook the pig right away, let's say you want to stuff it today and cook it tomorrow, the raw onion could spoil your stuffing. And then I have sage sausage pre-cooked and put it right under the stuffing. Pecans. Warm and beautiful. Parsley, good amount. Nutmeg, salt it doesn't need because salt is already in the bread and in the sausage. And my nutmeg. And now, a little bit of sage. That's all you need, sage is very strong. Sage in here. And now, what also makes it unique that most people don't realize, is the chicken stock. Chicken stock wakes up the gluten and the bread as well and brings all the flavors together. So you want to add as much chicken stock as your stuffing can absorb. You mix it up good. And remember, that stuffing will be cooking in the belly of the pig for about an hour and a half. So it'll, t it'll absorb all the beautiful juices from the, from the pig. If you could smell that already, it's sensational. So much flavor in there. All right, that is that. Let's put this over here, rest it for a second. So now I get my suckling pig right over here. And I'm gonna turn it upside down and I'm gonna put salt and pepper in the cavity. Lots of it. And now goes the stuffing. And I'm gonna squeeze it up all the way up the cavity all the way to the head. This recipe, I don't include any other starch because the stuffing is plenty. A little bit of oil in here, just a tad. I put some little salt on top, a little pepper, onion and some carrots, a little bit of celery. And I will deglaze this a few times so it doesn't burn. Now it gets ready in the oven and for about an hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes, depending. The way I recommend you cook it is first crisp it at like 375 and then lower the temperature to like three and a quarter. See you later. George Washington's expertise as a statesman and soldier is well known. But do you know 
how his interest in whiskey making came all about. Washington loved land. He loved farming. He loved the domestic life. He, you know, started out as a tobacco planter. But in the mid-1760s, his land is very exhausted from growing tobacco. So he had a big choice to make. He could stay in tobacco and go into debt or switch cash crops, which he switched to grain. And that's why he built the big merchant mill on this farm. And he exported flour for many years of his life. So Washington, he's a very dynamic businessman. Following the American victory in the Revolutionary War, many markets were closed off to the new nation. Popular products such as rum, which was widely produced by the sugar and molasses coming from the British-owned Caribbean islands, was now suddenly scarce. This led to a rise in whiskey production in the late 1780s and 90s. After his presidential years, Washington returns to Mount Vernon again, finally to retire and he's hired a new farm manager to oversee this 8,000 acre estate. And the gentleman he hired is a Scot named James Anderson. Anderson was a merchant and a farmer and a distiller. And he wrote Washington and says, you need a distillery behind your grist mill. It'll complete your business plan and I'm the man that can make a lot of money for you. In 1797, a reluctant Washington allowed Anderson to distill in his cooperage. And the result was an impressive 600 gallons sold putting Washington's initial hesitancy to rest. The success of 1797 led Washington to build the dedicated distillery with five stills. It's on the larger end of the spectrum of whiskey distilleries in early America. In 1799, in what would be the final year of Washington's life, he produced close to 11,000 gallons of whiskey, making it the largest distillery in America. The suckling pig stuffed with my pecan stuffing is in the beehive behind me. Like I said, it's going to take some time, but we got a lot of things to do. The next course I make, which is actually the appetizer, but the pig had to go in first, it's a pork kidney. Working in a family restaurant. This was one of our number one dishes that would be sold. A couple of times early on in my career when I didn't clean it really good, guess what happened to me? I got a kick in the butt from my uncle. And the, the reason for that is, this membrane in here, if I would cook this like that, you most likely couldn't even eat it. This is the filter. So this one over here, I'm gonna take the knife underneath, and I'm gonna cut that out. And this is very important. So it's just shooting it like that. The trick later comes, you gotta cook this in extremely high heat, and you make the sauce on the side. Let me wash my hands in my 18th century sink. So the kidney is prepared to be sautéed at really high heat. Before you do that, however, we're going to make the sauce. So, good amount of butter in there. Nice hot spider. Finely chopped shallots. Now we let this sweat down, no color. Deglaze with red wine. Now the onions in there, I don't want it to be too cooked, I just want to get them a little blanched. I want to later be able, so you can feel them. Brown sauce, any brown sauce would work. Mustard right now, here we go. Sour cream. I transfer the sauce from the spider to a dachi, and I want to bring it up to my set. Beautiful smell. You want this kind of sick, you're going to see in a moment why. I put some salt and pepper on the kidney. The spider is hot, beyond hot. Now I'm just going to put a little bit of olive oil, or any oil, very little. On the sizzle. And now comes the deglazing action with vinegar. Give it one quick swip. Now observe this in the wall of all. Now 
a little parsley on top, just like so. Wow, almost like home, beautiful. What a great way to start off a meal for George Washington. Whiskey making in the 18th century was hard work. Let's find out how it was done in George Washington's Mount Vernon estate. To make whiskey in the 18th century manner is a task of much manual labor. There aren't pumps and pipes like a modern distillery. A lot of effort, particularly when you think that they're making nearly 11,000 gallons in 1799. Steve, you're hard at work. How you doing, Walter? So good to see you again. Good to have you back. I just could not get the Washington's distillery out of my mind, and I'm so excited to be here. Why don't we get inside? Now let's go. All right. To make whiskey the way we do it here at Mount Vernon, it all starts in the grist mill. So we grind corn, rye, and malted barley, and then that grain is brought into the distillery. We have large barrels called mash tubs that hold about 110 gallons, and we bucket scalding hot water from our boiler and mix the corn and the rye first using large wooden mash rakes to stir and coat that grain. And then you let that cook for a little while. And basically what you're doing is breaking down the starches in the grain. So this is the setting the fermentation here and you can see all the steam from the boiler. It's pretty foggy in here. Beautiful. So as you know, Washington made rye whiskey, but there's corn in it as well. So it's 60% rye grain, 35% corn. We start with the corn and the hot water which Corey's rowing in right now. And here in a minute now, we're gonna add the, the rye. You wanna try the row a bit? I love to. Okay. Let's see. Use the edge of the barrel as, a, as an oh, anchor. Oh, you're not kidding. Isn't that thick? And you wanna go all the way down? All the way down and You wanna have no, no lumps, I understand. That's right. So it's like making a beautiful sauce in my kitchen. That's correct. There you you go. wanna break it all down. Yeah, really beautiful, yeah. but heavy. It, I let you have it. <laughs> but again, the purpose of this is to cook grain, break down the starches, and later this afternoon, when the temperature's down, we'll add malt. So Walter, this has cooled down now sufficiently, the corn and rye has with the water, and now we're gonna add malted barley. Is malt the... is critical to converting oh, yeah. starch to sugar. Oh, it's a spectacular taste. The malt just, it's such a unique flavor profile to it. Great aroma. I'm dying to later try the finished product to see if I can find those flavors come back again, you know? They will come through in the whiskey, there's no doubt. When it cools again down to about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, we can pitch our yeast, and the yeast will go to work on those sugars, converting them to alcohol. Wow, look at very that. Very happy yeast, very active fermentation. Oh, are you so kidding? we're making alcohol right there. I can already smell the flavor of the whiskey. There's yeah, no it's question very about nice, it. isn't it? Yeah. So tell me, how many days, how old is this batch? I believe it's been fermenting two days, two so days. it's got another day to go. And then it goes over to the still? Then to the pot still. And the basics of distillation is we want to let the alcohol burn off first because it boils at a lower boiling temperature. So inside the still, when it reaches about 173 Fahrenheit, alcohol turns to steam. It'll then float up to the head of the still, by pressure be pushed down that line arm, and inside this barrel is a spiraled tube, the copper tube called the, the worm or the condenser. The whiskey flows out the back. What you see in the front here is actually cooling water being dumped out. Dumped so, out. If it would flow like that, you'd be in business. <laughs> yeah, but that would be a good, yeah. good return on our investment. So after the first pass, we have to double distill it. The grain and water that's left in the still is called slop, and all that becomes animal feed. Very rich food for the pigs and, and the cattle. And then once you have a clean still, you run the, the second pass of the whiskey through. So by double distilling, you jack the proof up quite a bit. You lose gallons, but you can get higher concentration of the alcohol. Okay, Walter, there's the Whiskey flowing out the back of the still here. Why don't you try some? Let me see. Wow, what a spectacular high whiskey. Only George Washington could have made this kind of whiskey. Back then, whiskey was not aged in charred barrels. It looked like vodka. It comes off the still clear, it went to market clear, and people drank it right away. The barrel aging of spirits really starts as a standard practice in the 19th century. 
And so that's why we see the amber colors of whiskey. And we do make an aged whiskey here at Mount Vernon as well. Steve, I've learned so much. Well, maybe you should take one of these too. Even better, thank you. <laughs>
The whiskey rebels were thinking about their personal situation, but Washington couldn't afford a, a war on his frontier in the first few years of this nation's existence. So he led an army of 12,000 men out to western Pennsylvania, more than he ever led himself personally during the American Revolution, and put down the whiskey rebels. And he was trying to say that you really have to pay your, your taxes and abide by the law. A law that he himself soon abided by during his years producing whiskey. Diana, so good to see you. Yes, Chef, I, always a pleasure. I just came from the Mount Vernon Distillery. Guess what I have here? Oh my George goodness. Washington's whiskey. Oh, That's let's, impressive. Let's do that plum cake. Okay, plum. let's do it. First of all, I'm wondering where the plum is. No plums in the whole recipe. <laughs> That goes back to pre-Victorian Britain where they just called raisins plums. And here we are with plum pudding. Plum pudding would be made early fall and then you put it in the cellar and then every couple of weeks you soak it a little bit of rum, a little bit of whiskey. So by Christmas time you had a beautiful richly soaked plum pudding. Delicious. So take me through it. Yep, we're going to start yesterday with our dried fruit. So our, our plums, aka dark and white raisins. We also have coconut, toasted almonds, walnuts, candied ginger, candied lemon peel, orange peel. Every dried fruit you can imagine is in that bowl, along with George Washington's whiskey. So it's been soaking in this bowl overnight, and we'll get started putting everything else together. We're gonna add this just before we get it cooking. So we'll start with our eggs here. Brown sugar, lots of good brown sugar there. Break the yolks in with the sugar. Okay, wonderful. We have another George Washington tribute, his porter. But you want a good, dark beer. I mean, I figured this is already devoted to George, so why not his porter? More whiskey. You can Absolutely. never have enough whiskey. All right, so I'm gonna get this together and set it aside. Would you mind cracking me open one of those fresh nutmeg? I certainly will. The mm. shell preserves the flavor. That's why you should never buy recount nutmeg in the store. Might as well use sand. All right, should do it. These are Sally Lun breadcrumbs, of course, but you just want a good egg bread so that it's a little bit sweet and buttery. So to our breadcrumbs here, we're going to add cinnamon, freshly ground clove, allspice, just a pinch of salt as well. So now we have our main components all ready to go. So in our flour here, we have this lovely lard. Of course, you could use Crisco as a, a vegetable shortening or something like that, but- Not in the taste of fish, though. <laughs> that's right. That's how our forefathers and mothers would have done it, so that's how I'm gonna do it. And you just wanna get it barely incorporated. If you would add the breadcrumbs for me. And before we start to add any of our wet ingredients, we just wanna make sure that all of the dry ingredients are absorbing the fat. Our egg mixture here, add it all in. Now we're mostly together here, so I'm gonna go ahead and add the fruit that we've been soaking, including all of the liquid that's in there. And then, believe it or not, this pudding is boiled over the stove. Four hours. For four hours. I wonder who had to watch it in the early days. I, I can't decide if they're lucky or if it's a punishment. <laughs> so how much rum and how much whiskey is in there? All in all, we have about a cup and a half of whiskey, actually. I feel no pain. No. <laughs> what I have is a pan and a lid. I've got butter rubbed on the inside of this pan and just a little bit of flour on the bottom. Sure. We're going to boil it so we don't want the water to get in the pudding, otherwise it will never set. And I'm going to carefully drop it into some simmering water. So for the modern cook, Diana, what's your recommendation? You do have to stay near it to make sure that the water isn't going all over the place or boiling up and again over into your pudding. Oh, Diana, it was a long four hours. I think a little too much whiskey, maybe. Maybe, maybe. But the end result is so worth it. Aha! Okay. You go ahead and soak that. Good. I'll grab these for us. Oh, yes. Don't be shy now. Well, I would be shy, but I want to have a sip, too. So <laughs> Can I be the first to cut in? I would be honored. How to describe? So beautiful. All it's blended so well together, it's really good, Diana. George Washington, I'm sure he'd be very proud of us today making the plum pudding with his whiskey. I'm going to drink to him. Yes. And all for his distillery and a taste of history. Mm -hmm.